So, here we go. Right then, thank you very much for coming along today. Really appreciate your time. Hopefully you had a nice lunch. Hopefully we're nearly there with another day and a bit to go. Um, so the session, just to clarify before we dive into anything, um, we're going to be talking about security at a high level. We're going to look at um, the roles and responsibilities within an organization who should really, uh, really own security and the different facets of security when we're dealing with data platforms at large. Okay, The objective here is that um, when you walk out and think, I'm responsible for X piece, other people may be responsible for others, um, and provide you some insights and some potential tools and some ways of looking at things that will give, allow you to build more um, robust, secure data platforms when you get back to the office. So that's what we're looking to do today. If that's not what you're here for, I won't be offended if you want to go off and find another session. There's fantastic content. I don't want you to get the most out of today, OK? A um, little bit of housekeeping before we start. Um, please set your phones to silence. Um, if you've got to take a call, please feel free, step out, come back. If you missed anything, just come chat to me at the end. We'll run through it. The slide deck will be put up online later on, along with the demos and everything like that as well. Past an organization is more than just Summit. We've got a whole wealth of online content. There's YouTube, there's the virtual groups, there's local chapters, there's SQL Saturday, there's virtual events in the likes of 24 hours of past, things like that. So wherever you are in the world and whatever your interest and topic area for data platforms, you'll be able to find something there. Okay. One thing I will say as well is at the end of the day, 5 p.m. in the community area, there is a Q&A for the board. I am on the board of directors for PASS. If you've got any queries or questions about what we are as an organization and you want to see th things change and move forwards, come and ask us, come talk to us. We'll be down there. The whole board will be there for you to interact with. Leading on to me, who am I? John Martin. Um, there's a Q. It stands for quail, of all things. A lot of people ask that. It's an old Isle of Man name. Um, principal consultant, JKM Consulting. I've worked with SQL Server for, well, forever in one form or another, developer, DBA, business intelligence, operations, that type of thing as well. Contact details are there. Feel free to uh, take those down. Drop me an email. Follow me on Twitter. Connect with me on LinkedIn. Um, Past board of directors as well. But yeah, that's enough about me. So security. Obviously, I was asked a little bit earlier who saw the keynote today. How many? Yep, good. I thought it was really, really good. Security is becoming something that we really need to think about. So when we start thinking about who owns security and what security is, a lot of people turn around and say, security is like an onion. It has layers. Okay? Data or whatever you want to protect is in the middle, and we've got an outer layer, and then we've got various layers within that. I think that's wrong. Okay? When it comes to security, it's more like Swiss cheese. Okay? <laughs> and when you think about it, an onion's great. If you, you look there, you see your onion, your, your fridge, you've got your cupboard, whatever, pantry. There it is. It's a nice whole thing. And every time you go through it, the whole layer is exactly that. It's impermeable. It, well, you can't get through it. There's no holes. The reality is, when we start implementing data platforms, when we start implementing any form of technology, and we start thinking about how we're going to protect data, okay, we have to think about it and say, well, I put this in place. But there's always a vulnerability in every single layer. It's your hole in your Swiss cheese. Okay? And the only way we build secure systems is by layering up our levels of security, one on top of the other. So when you think about it, if you're going to make yourself a sandwich, a cheese sandwich with Swiss cheese, you nice piece of bread, first piece down, two or three holes, and I can see the bread. Uh, when you take that out into our world, it's like that's not really a, a, an inherently secure platform. So I need more cheese. Another slice goes on turn it through 90 degrees. Nope, and still see some bread. Hmm, another slice, that'll do. Bam, turn it on again. Can I see the bread? Once we get to a point where I can't see any bread, bring that back to our world, we've layered in three, four, five different things to protect that data in one form or another. And it may not all be technology, it may be process, but we're in a much stronger position and where we've got those different layers, the layer from, so layer one will have several vulnerabilities, or um, maybe not vulnerabilities, but lacking capability in certain areas, the next layer up should complement the layer below it. Okay, So it should fill some of those gaps. You move to the next layer, that will fill the gaps again. Okay, And that's what we do when it comes to building secure systems. There is no one technology that will solve all of our problems. There is no one layer that will protect everything. Okay, 
So what we end up with is a nice cheesy sandwich. Okay? I like cheese. It's good. Cheese sandwiches are fun. Okay? But that's the way I start thinking about it, is how can I mitigate the issues that I have in every layer of my security when I build a platform? Now, being from Europe, and for those of you that saw the um, keynote before, four little letters, GDPR. Wonderful for me anyway, as a data professional, because it brings me, my technology, my skills, my industry to the forefront of everybody's mind. Okay, people really starting to get invested in, oh, there's a phone. People's really starting to get invested in their data, okay? You see people saying, well, I don't wanna give Facebook all my data, I don't wanna give Twitter all my data, I don't wanna give Google all my data, I don't wanna give, you get the impression, you get the message there. Okay, people are really starting to take an interest because our data is monetized. Okay, our data is also very sensitive because we use it. I mean, you think government IDs, social security numbers over here, called, referred to as national insurance numbers in the UK, date of birth, identity theft. I've been a victim of identity theft. I'm a data professional. I use password managers, everything like that. I've been on the wrong end of that. Okay, so it can happen to everybody. I mean, who here has heard of Troy Hunt? Okay, for those of you that haven't, go and Google him. He's a security um, MVP, researcher, um, prolific blogger, okay? He will help you educate yourself around just how many data breaches there have been and how many of your credentials are quite possibly out there and being used. So everybody should really look at using the password managers and things like that. It makes life a lot easier. But anyway, coming back to this. Let me start thinking about who owns security. How many people in the room are developers? I'll do some of it. DBAs. Yay. That's, expect that's what I was expecting to see. Anyone here from the sort of infosec side of things, infrastructure? A couple of you. Okay. So, who owns security? Is it the DBA? Is it the developer? Is it infosec? Is it infrastructure? Everyone. Yes. Okay, presentation done, let's go. <laughs> no. Everybody owns security, but everybody owns a different facet of security. Okay? And understanding where you fit into that puzzle, which layer you are in the grand scheme of things, because we have to work together. Okay? DBAs cannot protect the system in its entirety. Okay? DBAs are a sing single layer in that. Developers, you can develop the most secure platform in the world, but if it's not implemented correctly, it becomes less secure, okay? So we need to start thinking about what do we need to secure? As data professionals, developers, DBAs, we become very, very focused on what we do, what our role is, the technologies we support, the activities we perform. So when we start thinking about who owns security, we first need to understand and really think about what do we need to secure? And the most fundamental level for the data professionals, we're going to start saying, okay, well, the actual data themselves, I'm going to deal with a relational platform here as an example. I'm going to ignore access. I'm going to ignore file shares full of all that sort of Excel spreadsheets and so on and so forth. We're going to focus in the relational engine here because otherwise scope's too large. Now, speaking of scope, that's something you really want to understand, okay? When it comes to security, yes, I've got a systems approach. I'm going to look at everything. But you want to break that down when we start looking at our own responsibilities, what's our sphere of influence? What's the scope that we can action? What's the scope that we can work with? Okay, by making that scope small, it becomes a lot more manageable. Okay, and as we go through this slide, we'll start thinking about how that will be impacted. So we've got our data tables, and they may sit in one or two, table, one or two databases, 100 databases, 1,000 databases. Everyone's got the sort of big data culture going on. Oh, we've got terabytes of data. Well, that's nice. If it's all in one, two databases, it makes my life a lot easier as a data professional because I know where it is. It makes it easier for me to secure. There's a, a friend of mine, and he's got 7,000 databases per instance, and he has high tens to low hundreds of instances. Okay? That, no matter how big those databases are, they're not that, they're, they range in size from a couple of gigabytes, tens of gigabytes, not big databases, but at that volume, that's when it really becomes a problem, okay? And that's why I say start thinking about breaking things down in scope. 
So we've got both of our databases on a server. That's nice and easy. Okay. So, so far, who are we interacting with when it comes to this? So really what we're looking for at this level here with the tables and the database itself, this is primarily developers within the database itself. Okay. And the key things we need to think about is who owns the database schema? Developers, the app for devs, that type of thing. Okay. Could be third party vendors, in which case there's not much we can do about it. But if we write in the code, developers own the database schema. They're the ones that know how or should know what needs to go into making it work. Okay. The touch point between the devs and the DBAs is the database itself. Okay. So we start thinking about the server element of it. That's where the DBA really comes into his own. Okay, it's her own, their own. Okay, that's where we're creating logins. It's where we're mapping them through to the underlying databases. It's where we're using the various different technologies that exist within SQL Server to provide another layer of security. And then we come out to the network. And as we all know, it's always the network's fault. Securing data in transit between our SQL servers and whatever it is that's the first thing, of, the first port of call. In this case, we're going to take a sort of end tier architecture approach. So we've got a number of service tiers. Okay. So we're looking to protect the data between the server and these. What options are available to us? Again, this is where there's a touch point between the DBAs and the infrastructure side of the house. The DBA can turn around and say, okay, well, I'm going to put TDS encryption in place. So all of, the all of the TDS traffic that comes in and out of my SQL Server is going to be encrypted. We can put the certificates in place, the application, so it's encrypted there. The alternative is something like IPsec at the infrastructure level. Okay? You can then start to go down further. You need to use that at the server level, or you can then go down deeper into the networking device level. Okay? So now we're starting to interact with other people. Again, network team, infrastructure team. Okay? Are we doing things with group policy that we need to have at the server and operating system level? Okay, who owns that? Again, more touch points. The more touch points we have and the larger the scope, the more difficult it is to get everything to work properly. So break it all down. So going from there, a bit more network. This time we're going out to the app layer itself, the web servers, potentially out to the network there before it goes to end user compute land. Okay, this is not us as DBAs, as developers. It will be you, okay? develop your solutions in such a way of how are we going to send data between our, our service layer and our app layer, okay, the presentation layer, how are we going to work this. Typically, again, you'll look at dealing with the infrastructure side of things. We'll be using TLS encryption for the traffic, that type of thing. But again, do you need to look at encrypting the payload between client application, web application server, and the back-end services? Again, where do you look at doing all of that? What technologies are available for us? And then it comes out to the end user compute world. And again, this is where we're dealing with other areas of the business, other parts of the support organization. You can put all the security you want in place back here. But if we've got very poor security hygiene out in the front end, that data is just going to walk straight out the front door. OK? So this is where working with the 0365 admins comes in. And we start thinking up here about, well, what have we got with uh, data loss prevention, DLP technologies? Is it going into SharePoint? Okay, is it going to SharePoint online? Are we managing it on-premises? All of this comes together as a system. This is what we've got to protect from a database perspective. This is what we've got to protect from a data perspective. GDPR, HIPAA, a new rule that's come through from California, things like that, all make sure that it's not just, okay, well, I've got my database, it's nice and secure, but out in the front end, we're in trouble, okay? Yes, we are primarily responsible for this bit back here, and that's what we're working on, that's what we're doing our best to secure. But we are the ones that understand the value of data, what happens if, it can be, if it's breached, things like that. We need to turn that into business language. You do realize that I've got this many customer records in here, okay? GDPR means we've got a bunch of Europeans in there. A, they can ask us to perform actions around remediation of data, removal of data, things like that. But if that data is breached, the fines are 4% of your overall revenue or 23 million euros. So 23 million euros, some of these big banks, that's nothing. But 4% of revenue, that can hurt because it's revenue, not profit. 
So you think about these ones that run razor. So you think about something like Uber, which runs razor thin margin. They've got no profit to take something like that sort of hit from a GDPR fine. Okay. So these are the things that we need to convey to the business. We can say, this is why I need to approach this in such a way. Now we start thinking about segmenting it down. We start thinking about the scope. Well, we're going to put a bridge in there. We're going to say, okay, well, here's a, here's a line of demarcation. That's end user compute. That is, we will advise you the types of data that we have, okay, that we're managing. We'll work with the business to understand whether it's confidential, whether it's commercially sensitive, whether it's PII, personally identifiable information, or sensitive personally identifiable information. There's a couple of different classifications there. When you look at the GDPR and the, what, the Data Protection Act in Europe, at the very least, before that sort of precursed that. And sensitive PII is things like, um, essentially, uh, union membership, stuff like that, that if it gets out, can cause people some, some real problems, potentially, okay? Membership of organizations and stuff like that. So we can, we can advise, but that's really something down on that end we need them to take ownership of and we need to convey that, okay? The fact that something walks out the front door on an unencrypted laptop is not our problem, okay? Ideally, we want to architect a solution where we mitigate the amount of data out on the edge that we're dealing with and bring it back to where we can. But when we have got this, we've got obviously our development team, our administration teams internally. How many people here have got domain administrator access to their systems that are not network infrastructure support? I, I'm, I need to move over here. You know, in Europe, half the room's hands would have gone up. You know, which is bizarre. But yeah, we need to start thinking about segregation of duties. Okay, limiting the remit and the access that we have. We need to start thinking about, okay, when we take backups, where are we backing up to? Who has access to it, okay? On that infrastructure side of things, what you really want to think to yourself as well is, okay, uh, who saw the, the ransomware attacks that happened um, a few over the last couple of years, the sort of non-petcher stuff, where a large number of organizations worldwide got hit, data's being encrypted, okay? How do you prevent that happening? Okay, from SQL Server perspective, we're quite lucky because once that process has got locks on those files, not much can touch the data file and log files. But our backups, how do we protect those? Again, we start thinking about not just what's right in front of us, but we start thinking about the stuff on the periphery as well. So we've got our people there. We've got our end users we need to educate. Again, you're the ones that have a wealth of this knowledge. You're the ones that can sh help the business understand just what they've got on their hands. Okay. And then we've got our InfoSec colleagues, CISO, that type of thing, okay? How many people here have got an InfoSec function within the business? Okay. How many of those sit within the IT structure? Okay. Where I am, we've moved CISO function out of IT, okay? They do not roll up to the same CIO that we do. Can anyone sort of, anyone have a guess about why we've done that? Sorry. Sorry? Fox in the hen house, yeah. Essentially, the reason we've done it is because sometimes InfoSec, CISO, and operations won't get on. But like, why do you want to lock it down like that? That's just unmanageable. When that goes up the chain, that point that it intersects is normally the JFDI moment, okay? At which point, one side will lose, okay? By, by taking them out and putting them in parallel streams and reporting further up the chain, it means that you're forced to collaborate a lot better, deliver the end solution, but it also means that security is a lot more difficult to override. But also, it means you've got a, a key stakeholder for actually presenting your case as well when it comes to that has an administrative overhead that is not that it's prohibitive for us to put in place, and you start to find that balance, okay? But what we do, or the way, what I do, or what I recommend is give them information, okay? They may sit outside our org, they may sit in our org. The key thing they need is they need to be able to have visibility of everything that's going on from end to end. They're the ones that are now responsible for detecting intrusion, detecting attacks, detecting exfiltration of data, okay? So they have to span the whole lane. So as the DBA, as the developer, as the administrator, what I look to do is, okay, well, how do I push data out? Okay. Who here has heard of Azure Sentinel? A couple of you, okay. Go and 
Bing it, Google it, whatever. Azure Sentinel is uh, a seam. Essentially, it's a security um, window into log analysis. It's the best way to put it. You've got log analytics underneath it, and you can install an agent on your servers and send all that log data up to Azure, okay? And they can start leveraging a lot of capability, but it provides visibility, okay? So when you start thinking about pushing it from end to end, pushing that data out to give them visibility is great. We can then augment that with information like SQL audit, push that out to the logs, okay? Then it goes up there, they can do the analysis. It's not reliant on us to then think about making sure we're spotting something in the database. You don't want to find out that someone's locked out your SQL accounts, for example. Found that the other week. It's not fun. It was quite funny because it was the security guys scanning us that locked out their account. But again, they didn't spot it, I spotted it. That's not great. But the key thing to take away from this slide is really, it's a system from end to end, and we need to take a systems approach, okay? Think about those layers. How do we implement it effectively? Where do we implement it? Security by design. If you think of security as an afterthought that we'll build all of this and we'll stick a web application firewall on the front end and we're safe, we won't have SQL injection, anything like that, you are gonna have a problem, okay? You need to also adopt a mindset when it happens, okay? Not if, when. When Tara was saying this morning, is it 30% of organizations in the next year, two years, are gonna have a breach, okay? That can be something very innocent, so people internally see data they're not supposed to see, all the way through to, boom, Troy Hunt's dropping you an email to say that your credentials and something's been breached and they're out in the wild now, okay? So we need to think about how we're gonna do that, but prepare yourself. You're not gonna run around wailing, flaving your arms in the hair with your, with air with your hair on fire. You just need to be able to sit there and go, right, it's happened, now we fix it, now we deal with it, now we work with it, okay? So, moving on from there, has any questions so far? Any thoughts? Okay, making sense so far. Okay, not throwing stuff at me, so hopefully that's working good. But we need to think, what are we, are we starting with? I say we, we started there with the data, okay? Is it PII, is it sensitive, commercial data, okay? This is what we're looking to secure. So data is really, really valuable, okay? That's what our businesses transact on, that's what we do, okay? It could be survey data for oil and drilling companies, it could be customer data for retail organizations, okay? All of these sorts of things. We need to understand what that data is, we need to classify it as well. Now we start looking at the new versions of SQL Server, we're getting data classification built in. We start looking at Azure SQL Database, okay? We're getting it there as well. And that spans all the way out to the front. I mean, you've got data loss prevention technologies that work through the Power Apps platform, okay? So as that data lives within our organization, when it moves around in the organization, we can classify it and we can handle it appropriately. If we do not classify it and we don't understand what we've got, then we could end up in a scenario where security come down the line and say, just encrypt everything, okay? And anyone who's used TDE and had to speak to their storage admin will understand that encrypting many databases with TDE is not gonna go down well, unless you've got a very big budget to give him to go and buy shiny new storage arrays, okay? The way I like to think about it when we come to protecting data, would I put my data and the data that people I care about into this system? If the answer is no, take a look in the mirror, okay? What can we do to address this? Every system I support, every system I build, okay, I will turn around and say, would I put my personal data in there and that of my family? If the answer is yes, okay, we're into a strong place, okay? And then we start thinking about the compliance and regulatory requirements, GDPR, PCI DSS, HIPAA, we also then have things like Sarbanes-Oxley, which is not strictly a data regulation, but more around segregation of duties. How do we protect access to the data, okay? Now with the things like data lakes and everything, all those concepts coming along, Azure Synapse, what have you, where it's bringing all of this data together to be able to present unified views of it, okay? We need to start thinking about, okay, well how do we manage that access further out from the edge, or oh, sorry, from the core? The reason being is, we may have discrete pots of data that to get on their own don't add up to much, but when you start bringing them together, the value of that data and the threat associated with losing that data becomes exponentially more, 
Okay? So when you start saying, well, this reporting platform, this reporting platform, this reporting platform, one person has access to all three and can basically collate a larger data set and infer a lot more information into it, that's the type of thing we need to be thinking about, systems approach. Okay. Any questions? Okay. So moving on from there, end user security. End users are lazy. I know because I am one. Okay, quite simple. I don't want to do things that I don't have to do, okay? If we force people to jump through lots of hoops, they will circumvent or they'll do their best to circumvent it. I've done it as an admin, done it as an end user. Why do I need to go to 10 different places to put this piece of information? Ah, can't be bothered, I'm just gonna bang it here, you know? So I had an issue with a um, new system I'm building. The security was like, nope, we're locking this down, you can only RDP in from these servers, you can't move files in, we're locking down SMB and this, that next thing. Okay, fine, I'll just transfer stuff into my servers via a VMware data store, circumventing their stuff, rather than doing it through a more cohesive and coherent policy. You know, it's like, pff, I know what I'm doing. Web browser open, logged into the actual VMware host, upload that piece of software to the data store, log into my server, pull it down, and we're done. The reality is if they'd work better with me, we'd be in a better place. But that's me being an end user, by and large, not just an administrator. Like I said earlier, we need to start educating people. What is data? Why do we have it? What's the type of data we have? Okay. PCI DSS is a really good one. I used to work in a call center back at the very early days when I got out of college. Okay. And we used to take credit card payments over the phone. Do you turn your voice recording systems off? Okay. If not, how are you storing that data? Okay. How are we securing it? How do we age it out? What's going on with that time? Okay. We start thinking about screen recording. So if anyone here uses a, um, a PAM solution, privileged access management solution, where it does screen recording on your administrative sessions. Okay. It's starting to become a little bit more prevalent. So I'm speaking with the guys that are implementing it where we are and then raise the, the specter of it. Okay. Well, from a data perspective, What's our GDPR exposure on this one? Because if I'm in there troubleshooting a problem, trying to identify what's going on, and I'm looking at the structure of tables, I'm looking at data potentially, and it's going to come up on the screen and you're recording it, how do we handle that? Are we storing it securely? Okay. Is, if that gets breached as a periphery system, potentially it has personally identifiable and other sensitive information in it. So the tools that I'm using, again, as an end user. We start thinking about the end user we're servicing ourselves, okay, the key thing to understand here is that they're our end user, they've got a job to do, let's help them do it, but let's help them do it in a secure way, okay? We're the experts. Everyone in this room is an expert, okay? You know data systems. You have it within you to educate these people to help get us to a much stronger position. I know you do. So that's the data itself, those are the end users. They're the things that are typically a little bit more out of our control. We have, we're at the behest of the business about the types of data they want to, to draw in, the type of data they want to store, the type of things they want to do with that data. Where it starts to get more in for, for our realm is around architecture and security teams. Okay. Now this is, a, this is a fun discussion, this one. Architects should not choose security, they should not choose technology. Okay. Quite simply, architects are there to direct us. Those of us on the ground doing the job day to day, we're the ones implementing, picking technologies, implementing solutions. They're the ones that should be pointing us in the right direction. We're the ones that do the work, okay? Security and security architecture should come together, okay? You've got solution architects, you've got um, enterprise architects. There should also be some elements of security architects in there as well who are specialized at what they do, okay? Everyone should have security at the forefront of their mind, but there's only so much we can retain. I speak from personal experience. I don't remember all the syntax for SQL Server and PowerShell and things like that. I'm just very good at using Google, okay? That's not really how you want your security architects to work. You kind of want them to have a strong appreciation for what's out there. But they should not decide on the detailed technology, okay? They should be out there looking at the more general threats, understanding what the business is doing. We then get the requirement for, we need to secure this type of data in this sort of way We'll find the end solution. That's what we do, okay? They may say, well, you're going to use Azure or Amazon or Google. 
as a cloud provider, but then you're the ones that should be going in and saying, in order to actually build this system so it's secure and we can administer it effectively, we need to use these different services and these different technologies. It's all down to you lot, okay? And they also help define patterns and practices. Are we going microservices? Are we going SOA? Oh, wait, they're one and the same. Are we going monolithic applications? Are we doing self-service? That type of thing, okay? Again, this is giving us guidance on the types of systems we need to implement to allow our businesses that we work for to be competitive in the marketplaces so that we've still got jobs, okay? That's really what it comes down to. So then we start thinking about operational security, OPSEC. Okay. They should define very high level standards for us. They should be saying, these are the algorithms we'd like you to use. Okay, this is the type of thing we want you to implement. We want you to implement transport level security. Okay, they're not going to tell you you must use this specific certificate type or anything like that, or you must use TDS encryption over IPsec. Okay, they'll specify this is what we're looking for. They'll specify some of the configuration standards, like we want to make sure that we're not developing platforms that are vulnerable to SQL injection attacks, because pfft, still happening today. Okay. Grant Fritchie's got a couple of good sessions on that, as has a guy called Mladen Pradic from Slovenia. You can check his stuff out online. Really worth having a look at, especially around SQL injection. It's really easy. I mean, I say really easy. It's, it is when you start concatenating strings. I mean, I was asked to review a stored procedure just the other week where, again, they're just concatenating strings. I'm like, this is a problem. Oh, no, it's not. Five minutes in, I'm creating extra databases on the server because of the way they've implemented it. So it's about winding that back. So it still happens. Because there was no direction from operational security. It was just like, get it done. Working through that. They're the ones that should be reviewing logs. So we'll have daily checklists, OK? Is my server alive? Did it fall over in the night? Did my backups happen? All of this sort of stuff, OK? But overall, they're the ones that should be looking at the web logs, the, the SQL logs, the server logs, bringing that all together to pull something together. Things about being identifying what do we need, what information do we need in order to identify and mitigate threats that we see out there. And that will change, okay? Log aggregation, I don't want to have to run out and look at every single server individually. How can I bring all of that together, okay? The other key thing to understand here is how do I guarantee that data has not been tampered with, the immutability of it? We start thinking about it. I mean, Idera out on the expo floor have got a compliance tool that I've used in the past. Really useful and it helps, ident it helps track whether or not something's been tampered with. If I try to roll my own, I then have that headache, okay? Yes, it saves me a few quid, but will it stand up to audit? Yes or no? So we just need to start thinking about those. They should also be involved in the commissioning of new platforms as well, okay? Does it meet the needs? Does it give them the information they need? Do we need to tweak things? They work with us, or they should do. Okay, they're the ones that will specify where the pen testing needs to happen. But again, you need to educate them. No, we don't need to pen test that system. We've got a common design that we're using. Okay, coming back to the architecture that we deal with as well. From an engineering perspective, there's a couple of different ways you can look at it. If you've got architecture and operations, if you can get an engineering function sat in the middle that will define essentially the building blocks of the platforms we need to build. Okay. So we're going to implement SQL Server 2016 or 2017 or 2019. And this is the standard configuration that goes out the door. And that's what the engineering team would do. This is how it's configured around server configuration options, database level configure options, that type of thing. Okay, when you need a deviation from the standard, you log a request, you get it logged, it's all approved, boom, we move forwards. Which means when audit comes around, we're able to satisfy those requests. Okay. Likewise with pen testing on new platforms, what do we need to do? If we've got a standard design that we're implementing, it doesn't need to be pen tested every single time, but we need to pen test it once. Additionally, some of the things we need to think about is, um, this is probably more, who here is handling European data? There's a few of you, okay. If you're making changes to platforms, the, and the, the, the fundamentals of it, either at the application layer, potentially even at the infrastructure layer, there's a privacy impact assessment that you really should be doing from a GDPR perspective. Okay, and this is essentially I'm saying I'm making these changes and this is the impact it's going to have on the data that I'm handling, whether or not it's making it more or less secure, things like that, whether you've got any compensating controls going in place. Helps make you think and make the business think. Okay, 
So make sure you're filling those in as well. And then you present all of this to operational security and say, we're ready to go live. Get out of the way. OK. So just whilst we're talking about OPSEC, I'm going to have a quick look at Azure Sentinel. Um, it's a really useful product. I've had a look at it. I'm working with uh, a couple of teams to, to try and bring it into where I am at the moment. But if I uh, just duplicate my screen. OK. You should be able to see this. OK. So Azure Sentinel itself, if we look back at the workspaces, uh, let me just zoom in. So I've got past Summit 2019. It's built on top of log analytics. Anyone familiar with log analytics? OK. Um, anyone here using SCOM? Right. There's a plugin for SCOM that will let you basically push data to Azure and put it into a what's essentially a bottomless pit that you can then query very quickly across your entire state. Fundamentally, Azure Sentinel is built on top of that logging capability, that query capability. OK. So we drill in there, and straight out of the box, um, we can come in and we can start seeing, OK, well, how many events are we capturing? Have we had any alerts? What sort of incidents are we getting? We can see all of that here as well over time. And this is just from four Azure virtual machines. If you want to generate data for this, open up RDP to the rest of the world. It's quite interesting. We start coming down, we can see where things are coming from. And then we can come across and we can say, OK, well, we've got workbooks, incidents, all that sort of stuff here. This is, the type, this is the world that our operational security teams come into. This is what we need to feed into, really. So this is where you, you install the agent on your servers and you can push out your security event logs, for example. So you haven't really got to audit them. It's not your problem anymore. Make it somebody else's problem. As a DBA, yes, I want to make sure my system's secure. But at the same time, I don't want to be trawling logs every day I want ones for things that I can't affect. I want to make sure that my backups are working and that my restores are running and CheckDB is functional. But at the same time, I don't want to be responsible. Oh, yeah, I've had 200 times this account's tried to be logged into. Well, I can notify someone, and then it's, I'm handing it off. If I don't need to do that notification. I know someone's looking at it. Their window is Azure Sentinel. So we start coming across and look at some of the workbooks. This is where we say, OK, well, what are the activities? We can see account failed to log in. Um, let's have a look at this server here on this one. So we can see successful log on, logged off, special privileges assigned, um, key migration. OK, so there's a whole raft of things that we can look at there. If we look over here at um, some of the user activities, I've got a lot of activity coming in for administrator. Ah. Like I say, if you open up your service to the internet, people will try to log into them, which is quite useful for my demo. But yeah, this is just an example of what you can see. Administrator, admin, admin to an non lab, admin, user, test, all that sort of stuff. We can start seeing what sort of activities going on for these. We make that somebody else's problem. We feed them that data. So when we're building data platform solutions, leverage these technologies, push that data off, make someone else do the work for us. OK, so well worth having a look at. And then we can scroll down and we can see all the other bits and pieces that are coming through. Um, log on failed, all that sort of stuff. And we can see it across all of the other servers. Very easy. And if, whilst this may be a primary tool for operational security and things like that, it can be very beneficial for us. So one of the things we can do is we can use SQL audit at the server level, the database level, to push things out to the security event log. It then gets captured and sent up to this. OK, that helps us solve the immutability of have the logs been changed? Have they been manipulated? Things like that. We, we make it more difficult. Okay? Those agents are sending that information out for us. Strongly encourage people to go and have a quick look at this. I'm not going to dive into it in too much, as really it's a case of this is what it is. Go and explore, see how it will work for you. But again, you can get a lot more information around what's going on with it. Any questions? OK. Let's get back to the slideshow. OK, so security and the developer. I know there's only a small number of developers in the room, but they are some of the most important people we have to interact with when it comes to building secure data solutions. OK? Microsoft have put a lot of effort into adding security features that are really targeted towards the development side of things. OK, so who, with, who has looked at 2016 and seen always encrypted? OK. Dynamic data masking. 
Row level security. Okay. Go and check these out. They're in the engine. Okay, as of SP1 in 2016, I believe most of them are in standard edition as well now. They're all in up there in Azure SQL database. Okay, these are technologies. These are tools that we can use as developers when we're developing database-driven solutions to help not have to roll our own. Okay, I've worked with row-level security before in Dynamics CRM, back in the day when they used to use layered views and functions, and boy, did it suck for performance. Okay, now we're getting that sort of capability built into our relational engines. Makes life a lot easier for us. Okay, things like always encrypted can solve a lot of problems for us. Encrypting a whole database with TDE means that we're basically zeroing out the whole file, which means we'll see negligible compression because you get random patterns that are not repeating within there. Okay, non-deterministic patterns, which means the data's there, which means I don't get database compression. Using something like always encrypted takes that to the column level. So I can, only, I can go in with a very targeted mechanism to encrypt the columns that are important for PII data and other sensitive data. The other benefit is that data is encrypted at rest so the administrator can't see it. That data is encrypted on the wire to the application. It's decrypted the application side of things. By leveraging things like Key Vault and HSMs, you can actually segregate uh, good segregation of duties so you're protecting the certificates and keys that are required to do that properly. So we build secure solutions. And we're protecting ourselves. So speak with your development team. Encourage them to have a look at these technologies. If you're building your own systems on SQL Server 2016, 2017, 2019, or Azure SQL Database, go and speak to them about these technologies. They will make our lives easier because by not having that data easily accessible for us, we're protecting ourselves. We put another layer in there, okay? They own the app layer and the database layer, okay? Now, they're essentially the bread, well, not the bread, yeah, they could be the bread and sandwich. Either way, we've got various different layers, but they, they're down at the bottom and they're out in the front as well, okay? And everything in the middle that we're building up is a sort of distribution between us and the other administrative, administrative teams within the organizations, okay? By doing this, they need to coordinate the activity. By building this together, they know the application requires certain permissions in the database to access certain tables, certain pieces of data, to fill the objects they have in their applications, okay? So different services and the service layers they build. Okay, what this means is that you should be built together. Okay, everyone goes, oh, we'll go code first and it'll just create the database for us. That's great, but it sucks from a security standard perspective because it just spawns all the objects you need, but none of the database roles. Okay, and we'll come on to those in a moment. So really, when we speak to development teams, we need to say secure by design. Okay, if you go schema first, it gives us a chance to build all of the objects out we need and put a good security wrapper right there down in the database layer, okay? Fundamentally, if that data is not leaving the database to transit to the application before it's being thinned out, we're in a much better position. If there's less data coming out from a performance perspective, we're not having to scan as much on disk, we're not using as much memory, but at the same time, we've not got data in transit that we have to protect. We've not got data in memory that we have to protect out there as well. Okay, we've not got people getting stuff into the application, dumping it to Excel and taking extra stuff. Minimize data that you're sending out. Keep it close. Only take what's necessary. Only grant permission to columns that are necessary. Now, ultimately, we don't want to be doing this all the way down and saying, oh, column level security, that's not the next thing. This is where views and this is where stored procedures come in. Bread and butter stuff that we do for years. Still very relevant today. Authentication user management, okay. Help them understand this. As a DBA, an administrator for the database platform, I don't really want to get into the guts of the database because if it's got hundreds or thousands of tables, stored procedures, views, functions, I don't give two hoots. I don't want to have to manage that. What I want to do is create a login, map it to a user, stick the user in a group in a role, my job's done. Okay? So explain how database roles work to your, your, your development team. Work with them to help them understand this effectively and just the power that it can give us about the encapsulation and the abstraction that views and stored procedures and functions can give us. Hell, Connor and Bob showed us the other day that functions might actually be getting usable in 2019. So well worth having a look at that potentially again. But really sort of comes back to leveraging all of those tools that Microsoft are giving us in the SQL Server engine, okay? There's a lot that we can be doing there. Any questions so far? Okay. 
one of the key things is, is about decoupling and, and basically modularizing, compartmentalizing the system as you can. Think about touch points, OK? Come back to what I spoke about earlier with scope. If you reduce the scope, it's easier to protect something. Now, I used to work for an organization where we did PCI DSS and we had external auditors coming in through a payment processing company, OK? They're not necessarily technical. When you try to explain VLANs to them, they get confused. And they say, no, your core switch, everything transits through it. Everything's now in scope for PCI DSS. OK, I'll go buy some small switches. That's easier than trying to explain this to people. You may get an auditor that actually knows what they're doing. OK? So if you can decouple it and those touch points and say, up to here, minimize your scope. OK? Makes life a lot easier. When you start compartmentalizing things into schemas, it allows us to secure things easily within databases. We start using views and stored procedures. We grant access to those rather than the underlying base tables. We're minimizing the columns that need to be seen by the different functions. Okay. I used to work for one system where we had a single database. We had over 100 different applications talking to that database. If you're not securing things effectively and you've got one account that's got DB Data Reader, DB Data Writer, and that's for your 100 applications, all bets are off as to what state your data and database are going to be in. Okay? Help abstract away that complexity, okay? And database roles. So we start thinking about it. Okay, we got the, the application, the transport layer. From a developer perspective, they're out of scope for this piece of the discussion. Okay? The application does what the application needs. They write it in C sharp, they write it in F sharp, they write it in whatever they want. And we start dealing with it when it gets to the database server. What options do we have? Well, the development not really going to be too fussed about server-side stuff. That's, again, the realm of the DBA. So when I say we work together, we work collaboratively to, to build secure solutions, they're going to be more focused on, OK, well, how do I make the data, the data bit secure? OK? So we start thinking about what we've got within there. We've got database roles, we've got views, we've got procedures, OK? All of this side of things. Makes life a little bit easier. Minimize what we're seeing. We've got row-level security. Um, if we come down into the actual data table structure themselves, row-level security, always encrypted, dynamic data masking. Row-level security is an interesting one. So whilst dynamic data masking is more aligned with the security model within SQL Server and the authentication mechanisms, what you're looking at for row-level security has to actually be fully architected into the data model as well, because you need to be making sure that for row-level security to work, you need to find something on the rows of data that will allow you to say yes or no to whether or not it needs to be made visible to the appropriate users. Okay? So this is where I'm, I've got a demo in another session I do where we use hierarchy ID to identify managers and all of the subordinates. Okay? So that way the managers can see themselves and everyone below them in the, in the hierarchy. More difficult to do. That's the sort of thing it lends itself to. You also then need to start thinking about referential integrity. Are you going to rely on that to filter your results? And this is where it comes back to saying, OK, if I'm going to start mitigating and minimizing access to the underlying tables, referential integrity can help. But if I've let people go straight down to those tables, how do I apply something like row-level security across the entire data model where I may have common reference data that needs to be seen by some but not others? Again, it starts to get a little bit more complex, which is why it needs to be architected into the data model. But essentially, we're looking at saying, OK, well, how do we deal with the different layers? And it, it, like I said, it's lots and lots of layers of Swiss cheese. We're trying to cover up all those holes. Okay? And this is what's available to our development colleagues. Okay? Let's work with them. Let's make it happen. So who here is confident they know exactly how database roles work and use them on a regular basis? A few of us. Cool. In that case, we'll have a quick demo. Um, all the code here will be made available after the case. So. Just jump in here a second to my VM. Do, do, do. Roles. So um, first things first, I'm going to create a database. And then I'm going to just add a couple of tables. And I'm going to add some users. Now, what I'm going to use here essentially is the execute as, so I don't have to keep re-logging in with everything and doing all sorts of connections. OK. So we'll create that one. Done and populate that, which is good. So I'm going to just load some data in my customer table. 
Um, so we'll see what's there. Just a standard sort of insert statement for you. And then what we're going to do is I'm going to create, and basically I've got the users that I created at the top. What I'm going to do here initially is basically add user one to our DB data reader. Now, database role, what's wrong with this? Okay, in we go, drop them in, happy days. Okay, off we go, boom. What it means is, when I execute this piece of, I do select star from customer. It gives me access to that quite happily. But what it means is, I've not had to, oh, wrong one. I've not had to specify that the user has access to that specific table. Okay, DB data reader just gives me carte blanche access to go and read data from any object within the database. I'm reading it, whatever I want. Okay, DB data writer allows me to do much the same. Okay. So whilst it's a good starter for 10, it's not going to let us build solidly secure platforms. But it's definitely a step up from DB owner. So we come down. Come on, here we go. What we're going to do here, I'm going to create a view. And then what I'm going to do is basically say user two is allowed to access the view. OK, nice and easy. Do that. So what we'll do here is we'll have a look and say, OK, we'll use a two. Let's go on there. So user two, what we're going to do, access the customer's view. Off we go. We can see we've got a subset of columns there. So if I want to come down and say, OK, well, what about if I access the raw customer table as user two? I don't get it because I haven't got that. So I'm now starting to protect those extra columns, which in this case, things like gender, um, date of birth, other sort of sensitive PII information, email addresses, whatever we want to do. So by do, using views, restricting that. But at the same time, it's OK. But it means I've got to manage security at an individual user level. This is where our database roles come in. So I'm going to create a user called base user. Oh, sorry, a role called base user. I'm going to grant select on that view two there. And then I'm going to add user three to the role. OK, much like we do with Active Directory groups for permissions. That's the way to put it. Now I'm going to execute that for the view without having to do that individual user. So obviously they inherit the, act and, uh, the access from the role. Same as. Now, if I grant select on that to the base customer role, down here, user three will now have access. OK. So again, just thinking about how we're going to use this makes our life a lot easier, but we don't want one group that does everything. Multiple groups, depending on the type of function, type of activity, we can break that down. Makes life a little bit easier. You can start using users within the database without logins associated and start doing context switching internally as well, if needs be. There's a number of different ways to do it. If you're going to use dynamic data masking, that's one architectural approach that you can look at taking because that's built, uh, dynamic data masking built into the underlying security architecture. Okay. Any questions so far? So it's, they're an oldie, but they're a goodie. Go and have a look at reusing them. Um, makes life a little bit easier for us. Hey, John. Yes. Yes, please. OK, so the question is, in large organizations with a high rate of churn for employees, how do you say whether or not people have access and whether they should have access? Yes? OK. So whether they have access, first and foremost, I would always look to fall back to Windows-based authentication with Active Directory groups mapped in as my login. OK? That will map through. Manage user access to those groups further out. Now, how do we say whether they should or should not have access? This is the more difficult one. And that's more, in my experience, solved by a business process, having a robust starters and leavers process. When people change roles within a business, it, it, the, it really comes down to, to, to wrapping that around it from an external perspective, from a process side of things, using sort of identity management solutions when you start getting up into that level. As people, I, I perform this role, there's a, a specific set of access I need for that role. And as I transition out of it, using automated systems to remove that. There are a number of applications on the market which allow you to basically say, this is my database, this is the 
user, oh, sorry, this is the user I have, it's mapped to this login. That login is actually an Active Directory group who's a member of that group and nested groups. So you can drill your way back out. You can roll your own quite effectively now with PowerShell um, using things like uh, DBA tools set and then add that to the standard sort of um, AD PowerShell commandlets. So it's difficult. Where I am at the moment, we're instigating a six monthly review that the application owner has to take on board with who owns it, things like that. So it's an amalgamation of technology and process. That one? Yes. Yes. Mm. Yep. Okay, so the question is, do you need SQL authentication to use users in the database without logins? Okay, I'm logged in as a Windows user, and I've just created these, oh, sorry, I'm, I'm logged in as a Windows identity that's connected to the server, and that's where my authentication piece is. I'm then contact switching because I've got the appropriate permission to do so in the database. So I don't need to create either SQL logins or anything like that. There's something I'll, I'll cover in a moment around when we start talking about the DBA side of the house. But I think if we have a more uh, detailed discussion after the session, that'd be great. So I can understand that and I'll add some notes to the slide deck. So, okay. Okay. So, let's just get back into the slide deck. So now we'd move on to security and DBA. Okay. Secure by design is a reoccurring theme here. Infrastructure and everything around the database itself. So this is where we're dealing with that interaction between the Windows environment and our environment. Where I am, I've, we've got a policy, SQL Server authentication is off by default. Okay, if you want that, you've got to raise an exception and you've got to justify why. Invariably, it's because the vendor doesn't support Windows. It's the joys of SAP and Oracle applications. Okay. The instance configuration as well. This is a fun one. Um, we need to start thinking about, I said that the developers are responsible for the database. They're responsible to a larger extent for, say, 90% of the database. The schema, everything that goes on internally. Database configuration options, database scope configuration options as well. They're the realm of the DBA, typically. Okay? Anything that will impact the way the workload happens, that's, where we that's our touch point. That's where we collaborate. Okay? Now, who here has databases that have got trustworthy turned on? Okay. How many people don't know if they've got trustworthy turned on on the databases? Okay, go and have a look, because this is going to be a fun one. Um, I haven't got the demo with me, but there's plenty of it there, and I'll put it up on the blog. But essentially, if you've got trustworthy turned on, and your database owner is a member of the sysadmin group, so whose da database owners are SA all the time? Who doesn't know? Go and check. If the database owner in that context is SA, or a member of SA, you've got trustworthy turned on, Anyone who's got database owner permissions essentially can then say, okay, execute as DBO and jump out to server scope. So when you start layering things up, that database is trusted, you've got high permissions and someone who's got high permissions on the server level means you're looking at privilege escalation. So this is where we need to start understanding what those configuration op and options are and mitigating them. I create a SQL user on all of my servers, even though I've got SQL authentication turned off, create a SQL user, that is just basically a member of public, that owns my databases. So if I have got to turn trustworthy on for whatever reason, because applications need it, many of them do, then I'm just looking at putting that extra layer in to mitigate potential privilege escalation attack. Okay. Your instance level authentication policies, all that sort of stuff, okay, this is where we create the, the logins, map it to users, okay? We're backing things up. How are we protecting that? Database encryption, database backup encryption. Who here is using TDE? Yep. Who here is using the native backup encryption capabilities in 2014 or above? A few of you. Uh, there's other third party applications out there as well do it. Encrypting the data before it lands out there means if so you do lose that file, then you're in a much stronger position because you can turn around and say to the order as well, that file was encrypted. Okay. There's a whole pile of other things that we can look at, TLS, backup encryption, so on and so forth. 
but there's trade-offs amongst them. So again, when we start thinking about the, the infrastructure from a database perspective, DBA perspective, applications out of scope. Transport level is in scope for us as DBAs. Like I say, you can turn on TLS encryption or uh, transport between your database server endpoint and your application endpoint. Start protecting that data. It is trivial to sniff packets on the network, especially in virtualized estates, okay? In VMware or Hyper-V, it is very, very easy to create a virtual machine and basically drop a network port into it and say, I want you to basically funnel a copy of every piece of network traffic through this port. We can sniff them easy. So if you start getting someone who has uh, got unprecedented access that they shouldn't have, it can be very easy to sniff TDS traffic. And data is sent clear text unless you're encrypting it with SQL Server. And we start thinking about the instance and SQL Server security options we have available to us. Server roles came in with 2012. I'd encourage you to have a look at these. Anything you've got to assign permissions-wise at the instance level to a login of some form, look at server roles. Okay, rather than doing discrete login level permission management, create a role, put it in there, because if you need to do the same thing a couple of times, it makes life a lot easier for us. We drop, create another login, drop it into the server side role, and we're done. Okay. TDS encryption, and then we've also got SQL audit, which is a very, very powerful tool. It's a real pain in the ass to use. Um, a guy called uh, Thomas LaRock's written some good books around it, some blog posts, and encourage you to have a look at those if you want to start using it. Um, but it's built on the extended framework, extended events framework in, in 12 and above, so it's well worth having a look at, okay? But what this means is we can actually take that information, we can push that out to the security event logs, so we can give our security colleagues more visibility about what's going on within the engine itself, rather than just your standard tracking successful and failed logins. We can actually get down to tracking access to objects when we start looking at also at database schema, uh, database object, uh, database audit. Okay, we start looking at the database itself, we've got database security. We've got transparent data encryption, backup encryption, okay. Partial containment. So there's a feature that came with 2012 called contained databases. The reality is they should be called partially contained databases because the full containment spec hasn't been implemented. But what this means is that you essentially move the authentication piece from the server entity to the database, okay. So you can create logins and you can move them into the database. What that means is, and the way that it manifests itself for end users, is that when I log in and I authenticate against the SQL Server, I specify the database I have access to. And when I look at it in Object Explorer, for example, what I see is that database and master. I see nothing else that's on that server because that's what I've authenticated to. Now, I've worked with some customers in the past, back when I used to work for Microsoft, I sent out to the field, we, we worked together Third-party vendor apps, we actually leverage some of this partial containment activity. So things like Citrix and stuff like that, where it's a one-to-one -one relationship between the application and the database it's interacting with. If it's doing cross-database queries, don't even bother, okay? But if it's dealing with a single database, there's a potential that your applications can leverage partial containment. If you've got user-based access where people are querying things directly with Management Studio and you know they're only querying single databases, look at enabling partial containment for the server in that database and then put in their authentication at the database level. What it means is when they connect, they won't see any of the databases, okay? Which avoids you then having to go and hide all the other databases and set up the configurations at the server level so that you're trying to mask what else is there. It makes life a little bit easier because they're scoped to the database, okay? I'd really encourage you to have a look at that one. It can be very, very powerful. And then we've obviously got our backups. And again, it's all about that defense in depth. Now, when you start layering all of this together, we've got multiple layers in the database. We've now got multiple layers at the server level, and we have layers outside of that as well. We're building more secure solutions because that's what we're trying to put together, okay? So we'll have a quick look at transparent database encryption and backup encryption natively within SQL Server um, because Microsoft is starting to bring a lot more of this functionality back into where we need it to be, okay? So, so I believe with 2019, TDE is now available in standard edition. TDE before that is enterprise only. Uh, things like uh, partial containment, I would have to go and double check on. So sorry, I can't answer that one right now for you. So let's have a quick look at TDE. So there's two options here. One, I'm dealing with everything in the context of the server. 
Um, the other option is that you can use uh, an extensible key management functionality to plug into an, either an HSM or Azure Key Vault to manage your certificates outside of the, the system. Okay, We're going to do it all natively here. So essentially what we're going to do is I'm going to create a, a master key, and I'm going to put a really long password in it. Um, and then I'm going to create a server level certificate. Okay. Let me do that. Scroll down. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a database which I'm going to encrypt. It's going to be five gig in size with a one gig translog. Okay. That'll take a couple of moments. Has anyone got any questions whilst we're waiting? Yes. Ah, because we're not there yet. Give it a couple of moments. <laughs> Good spot, though. Yeah. Basically, when you're creating databases, you don't have the option to create them encrypted. It's basically you've got to create them and then encrypt them. Okay, so that's the workflow, which is a little bit convoluted. It would be nice to have a, as I'm creating it, encrypted sort of option. So, <clears throat> sorry, I missed. Uh, sorry, Mike. Yes. OK, so this is just for the purpose of this demo. I'm just going to fly through it. Please back up your encryption keys, because if you don't have them, you can't restore anything. You know, so if you try and bring databases back online, things like that. Now, if you're using availability groups as well, you need to be aware that if you're going to do a TDE encrypted database, you need to make sure you've got the, the certificates on all of the servers as well. OK, so now we've created our database. This is where we go. I'm going to create it with um, database level encryption key within the database. That's the algorithm I'm going to use. And I'm telling it which server level certificate I want it to do the encryption with. OK. You'll see here you get a warning. It's not been backed up. Go and back it up. So then we come down. And this is where we actually turn the encryption on. So again, even though we've created everything, we've got to go in and say, make it happen. So that's running. So what happens is, if we come down to this query, we can see here now, tempdb is encrypted, even though we didn't tell it to. And TDE is encrypting at the moment, my demo demo base. The reason that tempdb is also becoming encrypted is because it recognizes that you've got an encrypted database, and therefore you may be creating temporary objects and stuff for that database. So tempdb becomes encrypted as well at this point in time. Okay. So just also bear in mind that you, you lose the ability to have um, instant file initialization with TDE because it's got to zero everything out. So just be mindful of that one. So let's see where we are. Still encrypting. OK, if we want to turn it off, again, it's just to turn the encryption off. Um, and we can keep an eye on that one to drop it. Now, one thing I will say is, we can run the cleanup. If you do encrypt the database and then turn the encryption off and get rid of it, TempDB will remain encrypted until you restart the service and it gets reinitialized. OK, so once you turn TD off on all of them, you've got to restart the service to decrypt, it basically reinitialize TempDB without the encryption on it. Any questions at all? Yes? Yep. Mm -hmm. OK, so if you don't have that password, You've got access to everything there. Uh, decrypt everything, drop everything, and then reinitialize it, because there's no way to go and find that password. <laughs> so yeah, not fun. So good, good sort of backup hygiene on that one, make your life a little bit easier. Um, let's see, is this encrypted yet? So that's encrypted. Um, performance hit. There is a small CPU overhead in my experience, but nothing major. Um, but your mileage will vary. It's, it's more to do with your I.O. traffic, really, uh, and that piece, because it's encrypted, it's transparent to the application. So it's in basically decrypted as it pulls it from disk and loads it into memory. Um, but just bear in mind, because you're zeroing everything out, you've got a number of other sort of artifacts to deal with. So backups will take longer and things like that. You won't see compression in backups as well. So it's not necessarily a performance impact on your OLTP or, or um, data warehouse workloads. It's some of the periphery stuff that you're going to see. Typically, that's my experience. OK. So that's there. What we'll do is quickly drop everything so I can move on to the next demo. 
Oh, sorry. How do you mean as in replication? So the question. So the, the question is, if, when I'm, talk, I'm going to assume you're talking about transactional replication and the like. OK. So it has no impact whether you're replicating from a TDE in database to a non-TDE database, because it's, handle, it's reading the transaction log file and replaying all of that. So it's, it's all part of it. It's transparent to everything there. It's really TDE is all about protecting and encrypting that data on disk. OK. So. Just come back up quickly. For backups, again, it's much the same. You create a master key. There we go. Then you create a certificate. Obviously, you should back the certificate up. Uh, I'm going to create my database. You can create a little table. We'll skip that bit. But essentially, when it comes to doing the encryption itself, We've got two options. So we look at the standard backup command there. Oop. Ah, no. It's not live one. There we go. We scroll down. You've got the standard one there. The other one is we basically come in and spay, say, this is what we're going to do. And it's certif a server certificate based. So you need to make sure that certificate is encrypted, uh, sorry, provided on all your servers. Now, one of the things you need to bear in mind with this one is back up your certificates, because without that, you can't restore your databases. Do not back them up to the same location you put your backups. OK? You may chuckle, I have seen it done. OK? They've gone onto the same tape media. OK, let's see if that's finished. Good. So if we just do this, joys of code reuse. So yeah, when it comes to doing the backup, it's as simple as, here we go, so doing a compression. Uh, there we go, to 288 milliseconds. If we do that one. OK, I didn't create a certificate. That was my fault. Whoa. Come on, four. Master key, miss. Uh. Did I create that one? Yes, it does. There we go. Oh no, okay. Uh, this worked earlier. Right, we'll move on from that. Oh, yes. You need to, res OK, so if you want to restore that. So if you want to restore that database on another server, you need to restore the certificate onto that first. So create the master key, restore the certificate, then restore the database, specifying the certificate onto that server. OK, so uh, do you, can, you create a the can you restore the certificate with a different name? I don't know. I haven't tried that. Um, so I won't say yes or no, I'm afraid. Sorry, I can't answer that one right now. I, I tend to keep my names unique. So moving on quickly to this one. We've got our server. We've got our databases. We've got our server level certificates. We've got database level certificates, depending on what we're looking at. We need to protect these from our administrators. We need to protect these from our developers. We also need to protect them from people who are going to nick stuff. When it comes to storing things, like I say, different location for certificate, different location for the database backups. Don't put them in the same location. If you lose one as well, you're in trouble. One of the options you could face, or one of the options you could have, is backing it up to the cloud, either databases or the certificates, because that way it makes it a little bit more people, difficult for people to run off with it. OK? So who owns security? Coming back to what you said earlier, yes, everyone owns it. It's cliche, I know. But understand which bit you own. Okay? You are not responsible for all of the security. That's the key thing to understand here. Because that's what most people find very, very daunting. When you start looking at this is, how the hell am I going to secure this? You don't have to. Okay? You only secure the bit. Identify what you're responsible for. Find that scope. Secure that as best as you can. That's all you can do. 
work collaboratively with your development colleagues, your security colleagues, your infrastructure support colleagues. By collaborating, that's how we build secure systems. Okay? So many things there. There's so many options as well. Okay? There's not one thing that does everything. There are many of them. Understand how they work together. Understand the, the deficiencies in one layer and how you mitigate them with another. Okay? The roles that we fulfill, not database roles, the roles that we fulfill in our day-to-day -day jobs are not what they used to be, okay? And they're gonna keep evolving. When we start thinking about DBA, developer, with a DevOps culture, it's not a tool, it's not software, okay? DevOps is a culture, it's a collaborative working culture. As that becomes more and more prevalent in our industry, we need to change the way that we work with one another, okay? As the technology we change, as the technologies that Microsoft produces and our, our industries and our, our businesses use change, we need to be aware of that. So when you start thinking about Azure Arc that's coming, Synapse, all of these new capabilities that are coming, our roles are going to evolve. We're going to become data engineers, data platform engineering. Okay, we're going to have to take on extra responsibilities. We're going to have to understand a little bit more. We're going to have to work together as team, build multi-skilled teams that cover the whole array. Okay, so just be prepared for things to change out under us. Don't be scared of it. The resources are out there, the skills are out there, the community, the network is out there for you to learn and to work with each other, to fill those gaps in your knowledge so that we can be prepared for the next 10 years, 20 years. And with that, I'd like to say thank you very much. Um, I would say please provide session evaluations. If you thought I sucked, please tell me why, and then I will suck less next time. If you thought I was good, please tell me what you thought was good so I can keep doing more of it. And with that, thank you very much for your time. I hope you have a great rest of the day.